Hello everybody, you're very welcome back um, for our afternoon session. So in this session we're really looking at um, taking a regional perspective, uh, perspective on the CRPD and we have some great speakers lined up for you this afternoon. Our first speaker is Victoria Lee. Uh, Victoria Lee um, currently works in the Human Rights and Disability Team within the UN Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and she previously worked for the International um, Disability Alliance as, as a senior human rights advisor. So you can read her full biography, which is very impressive, in the back of your pack. And I'll hand you over to Victoria um, to give her presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you all, um, to be here at the Galway Summer School, um, and to be here on behalf of the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. I'm going to talk about the European Convention on Human Rights and the CRPD. And I'm aware that there are many, many, many of us here. We're from apparently over 50 countries. So I was wondering if we could somehow signal who is not from Europe. Oh, <laughs> I think that's a majority, actually. I'm also not from Europe. <laughs> um, so it might be a little strange that I'm talking about this. Um, but actually, I first learned about the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court when I did an exchange in my Bachelor of Law undergrad degree in Strasbourg, France, where the European Court of Human Rights is based. And I was really blown away. I was super excited to learn about all this innovation that the court was undertaking, even cases which had been decided in the 70s. So it was, I mean, I was not studying in the 70s. Um, but um, for me, that was the first time I was learning about human rights, and I was very excited. So I wanted to share a little bit about the convention, just some basics, um, for those of you who might not be so familiar with it. Um, so, these are some catchphrases that the court is always using. They're, they're constantly um, referring to the European Convention as a living instrument. And of course, it's very important because we know that it was adopted in 1950. And the world today, compared to 1950, of course, very, very different. Um, it's, it guarantees rights that are practical and effective, not theoretical or illusory. So it really wants to ensure effective exercise of rights. Um, and this might go beyond the traditional civil and political rights which we think are enshrined in the convention. It might include implications of economic social rights in order to make those rights enshrined in the convention op operational. And then positive obligations. So the convention creates duties, of course, between the state and the individual, but also between and amongst private actors, so between individuals, uh, companies. So for me, when I learned about that, that was really opened up my mind. And the convention, the court today, continues to expand that jurisprudence. We know it's, it's been quite progressive um, with respect to, for example, domestic violence. And we can see how those really will play into uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. So we see that, I mean, all this innovation, um, for me, I learned that there's this interplay, constant interplay between law and, and society. And I learned that through innovative jurisprudence, we could really, the law could really trigger and guide social change. And that's very important in our domain where we need a lot of social change. So um, the European Convention of Human Rights is an instrument of the Council of Europe. Um, so that's a body which um, promotes democracy and rule of law. There are 47 member states, so it's beyond the European Union. And 45 of those states are actually members to this, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So there are two which are not, and unfortunately one of them is Ireland. <laughs> and the other one is Liechtenstein. Um, the convention is legally binding, so as we heard this morning, um, the effects, the decisions 
must be applied on the ground. And the Con Council of Europe actually has um, a mechanism in order to execute those judgments, which is the Committee of Ministers. So it makes it very, um, very effective in terms of um, changing the situation for the individual and also broad more broadly the system. And the European Convention, the European Court's jurisprudence, it's, it has a very widespread influence. It's not only those 47 member states which are applying the jurisprudence, it's other regional bodies, um, the treaty bodies, na other national courts from beyond Europe, which really take into account and are guided by the work of the European Court. So I just have a slide here which shows this is just a rough table I made, it's not exhaustive at all. Um, some intersections between the Convention and the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, I think, I mean, they don't have equivalent, equivalent provisions on everything. Um, something I might point out is, for example, equal recognition before the law, Article 12 of the CRPD. There is no equivalent in the, in the European Convention, but that is covered under Article 8, which is right to respect for private and family life. Um, Article 19, the right to live independently and li be included in the community. There is no equivalent in the European Convention. And to date, it has not yet been read into the European Convention's provisions, but there is some potential, and I will be getting to that. So before I get to the, the tensions and all the bad stuff, um, there has been some positive developments. Um, so. It, we know the, con the European Convention was adopted in 1950. There is a non-discrimination provision, and it sets out the different grounds of, um, of discrimination which are prohibited, and it's not exhaustive, so, and it does not make any reference to disability. So we had to wait all the way till 2009 for the first decision which found a violation on um, disability-based discrimination. Um, so, it, and in this judgment, it, it set forth that there is a European and worldwide consensus on the need to protect people with disabilities from discriminatory treatment towards full social inclusion of people with disabilities. And we think that the convention, I mean, obviously the convention had a lot to, the, Europe, the, the CRPD had a lot to, to, to play, uh, a big role to play in, in, in having this kind of, um, statement by the European Court. So it really is a statement which embraces the CRPD and takes note uh, that there is a, a not only European but a worldwide consensus on promoting the rights of persons with disabilities, which is very, very powerful. Uh, in 2010, we, we, got some, we also got some more jurisprudence, which um, is set out a precedent that if a restriction on fundamental rights applies to a particularly vulnerable group in society who have suffered considerable discrimination in the past, in this case they referred to the mentally disabled, then the state's margin of appreciation is substantially narrower and it must have very weighty reasons for the restrictions in question. So this morning we heard about the margin of appreciation. Um, it's the way that states have, may have a wide discretion in the manner that they implement the convention with respect to certain issues. What this is saying here is that where there is, um, where it, it, it addresses a particularly vulnerable group, such as persons with disabilities, that margin of appreciation, that discretion will be narrower. So the state really needs to um, account for why they are implementing the convention in that way if it's respect to a particularly historically dis disadvantaged group. Um, and that's really to avoid the legislative stereotyping which is so rampant when it comes to vulnerable groups including persons with disabilities. Some more good jurisprudence. Um, so the deprivation of legal capacity was uh, observed to constitute a very serious interference of a person's private life. Uh, in the case of Stanev in Bulgaria, uh, for the first time, the court 
noted that placement in a social care institution qualifies as deprivation of liberty. So that's something very groundbreaking because we know that uh, many persons with disabilities are institutionalized across the world and especially in Central and Eastern Europe, but not only. Um, in that case as well, for the first time, the court found a finding, uh, found, um, in, found a finding, no. Um, the court um, observed that in human integrating treatment, in human integrating treatment regarding the living conditions of an institution. Um, so I think we, we are very aware of the terrible um, living conditions that many persons with disabilities are in when they are institutionalized. So this was uh, a quite groundbreaking um, judgment as well and found a violation of Article 3 of the European Convention. Uh, more recently, um, the court finally made an explicit recognition of that the refusal of reasonable accommodation amounts to disability-based discrimination. Of course, this has uh, many, many repercussions. In this case, it was regarding the right to inclusive education, but we know, as in the CRPD, that reasonable accommodation is relevant across, across the board, across all sectors and all rights. So it, it opens the, the, the door to, to making these arguments before the court with respect to any of the convention rights. And then uh, also last year, um, for the first time in the court's jurisprudence ever, it recognizes um, and found a violation of discrimination by association. And in this case, it was uh, association to a child with a disability. Um, I, I was quite surprised actually to learn that this was the first time the court made such a finding because we know that national courts uh, have been progressive in this respect. So I think this also opens the door for many, many, um, to invoke many different um, uh, instances of discrimination and by association with a person with a disability. So to get to the other side, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk exhaustively about the convention because there is a lot of jurisprudence touching on a whole host of issues, but I just wanted to touch on a few issues which could serve um, as a guide for you to understand a little bit more where the European courts and the European convention stands when it comes to the rights of persons with disabilities. So I'm going to talk about legal capacity, right to liberty, and living independently and being included in the community. So legal capacity, um, so as I said, unlike Article 12, um, the European Convention does not have a specific provision on legal capacity, um, but this has been addressed under Article 8 of the European Convention, so the right to private life, family, and home, which of course addresses all aspects of personhood and personal development. However, the way that the, um, the European Court has been interpreting this with respect to legal capacity is, is not in line with the CRPD. In fact, the European Court accepts restrictions to legal capacity, even though it may call for maximum preservation of capacity um, and measures of flexibility. So in that sense, the European Court has been rather s focusing on safeguards on how and why restrictions have been imposed and not on the basic fact that such measures exist. So, for example, in a case um, regarding the right to vote and restrictions of legal capacity which result in denial of the right to vote, um, the court found a violation. Um, however, instead of calling for the abolition of legal of a guardianship or substituted decision-making altogether, it called for judicial, individual judicial assessments on the right to vote. Um, so really that goes against the CRPD and the CRPD committee actually has its own case on the same topic also regarding Hungary, Buidosho and five others against Hungary, where it really rejects the European court approach and makes it very clear that there's no uh, restriction, there should be no assessments on exercise of legal capacity and any related rights, including the right to vote. 
so the, the fact that it's focused on safeguards, it's looking at court reviews for declarations of incapacity, um, the need to ensure individual can challenge the decision for placement, um, uh, for, for appointment of a guardian. Um, so it's really uh, perpetuating the old approach of, of the best interest of the individual, of, um, um, which, which is overriding individual decision-making, autonomy, will, and preferences. Going to Article 5, I call it the bane of the European Convention, because we know, as we, we, I mean, most of us know, as we heard this morning, Article 5 makes an explicit reference to detention on the basis of unsound mind, so it legitimizes that measure. Um, and it can, the court continues to apply this using its winter warp criteria. So winter warp was a case from 1979. And in order to assess whether detention on the basis of unsound mind is in line with the European Convention, um, it, there's three criteria. It must be reliably shown to be about unsound mind supported by objective medical expertise. The mental disorder must be of a kind or degree warranting compulsory confinement, and continued confinement depends on persistence of such a disorder. So we see it's very medical uh, model based. It's completely out of line with Article 14 of the, of the CRPD. Um, so the European Court has been looking at standards again on the kinds of medical expertise, the independence of those, whether there's been a chance to challenge the, the review, uh, challenge the decision for detention, whether that was done by an independent body, et cetera. So really, it, it's, it falls very, very short of the CRPD, and um, it's the bane of the European Convention because it's in the text. It's not easy to change um, the European Convention. So it's something that we really need to, to reflect on and strategize on and how we can overcome this. And then living independently and being included in the community. Um, so as I said, there is no equivalent right in the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and actually, the European Court has never recognized this. Um, there's been many instances where, um, where cases have tried to, or applicants have tried to, to, to expand Article 8 on the right to private life and family and home to include the right to live in the community and, and living independently. So in the case of Stanev in Bulgaria, which concerned a man who was uh, institutionalized for many, many years, um, it was raised under Article 8, yet the, the court dismissed that, that argument. Um, and in another more recent case, AMV in Finland, where uh, a man with an intellectual disability um, wanted to move with his foster family to the north of Finland, um, and he was under guardianship, uh, his guardian and the courts denied his right to choose where and with whom to live. Um, and decided that it was in his best interest and protection to remain where he was. It was more comfortable living situation. His vocational school was closer. So it really extinguished his individual choice and membership in his family. And in that case, um, the court, uh, I just want to, to read some quotes. Um, the court deferred to the state's assessment and based on evidence relating to individuals' individ intellectual capacity and evidence relating to the individual's present and prospective circumstance in the case of a move. And in essence, the decision was based on a qualification of the applicant as a person with a disability, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see it's really, it was really a one-sided assessment um, not giving much value to the individual's own choices. I mean, we all sacrifice comfort, living situations, our careers, or etc., to live with our family, or to live with friends, or to move with friends, or to do whatever. In this case, he was denied even making that sacrifice. He was separated from his family, um, and it just shows the real disconnect that continues to persist within the European court. In this case, it's very interesting to read because the court makes all the right references. It talks about the different provisions of the convention, it talks about uh, you know, con consensus, European and worldwide consensus on promoting the rights of persons with disabilities. So it really 
embraces all that. But in the end, the result is one of um, we know better than you, uh, we know better what's best for you, uh, so you can stay and be separated from your family. So I just wanted to, to look at that phrase again. So in essence, this was not based on a qualification of the applicant as a person with a disability, which we can go person, parenthesis, with a disability. And really, I feel like this is what it means. In essence, the decision was not based on a qualification of the applicant as a person. So we have these divergent standards, and of course, um, these leads to risks. I mean, it was raised this morning whether um, there is harm in divergence of standards across different bodies, um, whether, whether the instrument is at the global or regional level. And I would say yes, because on the one hand, as a matter of practice, and this is something we see a lot on the ground and also in the higher political international arenas, if accountability mechanisms, including the CRPD committee, the European Court, etc., if they are not um, giving the same guidance, especially on very tricky issues, states and other stakeholders will not follow through with their obligations, or they will choose the least cumbersome option, which is the status quo, so no change. Um, on the other hand, um, we also have this international human rights framework, um, um, human rights instruments, um, and its legitimacy rests on the coherence of the system. So we risk fragmenting this very valuable acquis of the CRPD, of the human rights-based approach in this sphere, if standards continue to diverge. The risk is the dilution of the CRPD and fighting, again, the same battles. So this means retrogression. And we have many, many risks bef before us. Um, we heard about this morning the draft protocol to the Oviedo Convention, which seeks to regulate coercion for persons with psychosocial disabilities, so legitimizing it. And we are not helped either by this Council of Europe Disability Action Plan launched this year and which runs for the next 15 years, which uh, goes against Article 12 and seeks, oh, sorry, which. Um, which calls to go as far as possible to replace substituted decision making, um, but possible limitations in decision making should be considered on an individual basis, be proportional, and be restricted to the extent to which it is absolutely necessary. So again, out of line with the CRPD. But you know, there is still a way forward. I don't want to end on a on a very depressive note. Um, there's strategic litigation. Um, there's already been many. Um, advocates, NGOs, uh, universities, academics, which are engaging in uh, litigating before the European Court in a strategic manner. Because we don't want to proliferate bad case law. We want to you know, promote the, the positive developments. Um, and we need to see then, we need to think strategically together what areas are ripe that we can litigate on and which, are those are not, which of those are not there yet, so which should we avoid. Um, and this includes, of course, taking cases at the national level to then get to the European level. This could be amicus briefs directly to the European Court. Um, and also it can include amicus briefs to other regional bodies and national courts which take on CRPD standards because there is this constant cross-pollination amongst all these bodies. They all look to each other and learn from each other. So what, if we can promote the good standards in one area, that will reflect eventually on the others. And then there's building consensus and movement building. So at all levels, through litigation, uh, through conferences, capacity building, research and data collection, we want to build the case that there's a growing consensus for stronger standards and less exercise of margin of appreciation. So we see that the court is really fixed on that to, to track how, what is the emerging trend. So we want to add to that positive trend. And we do that by coming together. So like we are today here together this week, um, the more allies we have, I, I mean, the good news is that we have more allies today than we have in the past. Um, there's universities, academics, students and researchers. This morning we had the Special Rapporteur on Health, UN agencies, donors, um, development corporation agencies, DPOs, NGOs. So we need more awareness, more capacities, expertise, research. We have all of this more than ever before. And we need to channel that strategically. And then finally, of course, participation of persons with disabilities, including persons with psychosocial disabilities. And all these processes, 
including within the court and the court registry, Council of Europe generally. I mean, it would be great to see a judge with a disability at the European court or in the, uh, working in the registry. And I don't think I need to reemphasize the point with you, but um, we know the CRPD's immediate obligate, uh, contribution, which is the same as its end goal, is the participation and inclusion of persons with disabilities. So I just want to conclude on this. I want to show you a photo of Mr. Rusi Stanev, who's the former resident of the Pastor Social Care Home in the Rila Mountains of Bulgaria. For years, he was excluded, segregated, and denied choice. After getting in touch with lawyers at the Bulgarian Helsinki Committee, his case finally made it all the way to Strasbourg, to the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. So here he is at the court with his lawyer, uh, Annette Genova, in February 2011. I know many of him may know him, um, because after he won his cases, he became a participant of the Voices Project here at Galway. And so many of you might know that he passed away a few months ago. So Rusi's voice and story opened many doors. As Gabor said this morning, we have the paradigm and the power too. And I strongly believe that working together, we will open many, many more doors. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Victoria. And actually, Ruthie Stanov had agreed to speak at the summer school, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to be with us, this, you know, because of the, poor, the ter terrible circumstances. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Agustina Palacios um, from Argentina. She holds a doctorate in law from the University of Carlos III in Spain. She's a researcher of CONCINET, the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research in Argentina. And she is the Director of Disability at the Center for Research and Teaching in Human Rights um, in Mar del Plata in Argentina. So you can see a full biography for Agustina in the pack. So I'm going to invite Agustina to give the Latin American perspective in relation to the CRPD. In the first place, I would like to congratulate Dr. Mahoney and the organizing for this event. Uh, and I want to express my gratitude and my happiness for the opportunity to share this time with you. Uh, especially, I would like to thank Professor Sherar Quim, who some years ago was so generous uh, with me in the frame of a research stay that I have the, the privilege to do here in Galway with him. And I want to result his patient, uh, not only with me, but also with my difficult, diffic difficulties <laughs> to express in English, uh, like you can appreciate. So I ask you, uh, patient too, um, my proposal today is uh, share with you uh, four ideas. Um, the, the, the first, uh, uh, at the first time, I, I want to make a brief introduction. Uh, the paradigm shift from medical model to social model and the human rights approach uh, have, been, uh, in, have been introduced to the inter-American system. And now uh, we can say that the, at the inter-American system, we uh, can consider that disability is a human right issue and we are talking about the right to have rights in terms of Hannah Arendt and 
uh, like we um, uh, say uh, some moments uh, during the morning um, uh, inter-American system at, at the level of international law. Inter-American system is part of and at the same part is uh, nourished by international law of human rights. And in this matter, the, the bigger standard is the convention, no? universal convention. Uh, at the uh, inter-American level, <coughs> and <coughs> doctrine and jurisprudence has identified the existence of like a corpus juris uh, on disability through which the rational legislation could be applied in light of the social model reflected by the convention. And, and the, the best example of this uh, is uh, the committee of the Inter-American Convention. In, in the Inter-American system, we have an Inter-American Convention specific about disability, and the committee who, who applied this convention interpreted a key article of the Inter-American Convention in light of the uh, Article 12 of com the Universal Convention, legal capacity. <coughs> I don't, uh, uh, sorry, now. Uh, well, in, in, in the normative framework, uh, the normative framework is, is broad, and I, I take some rules, general and the, the main rules, um, norms, sorry. Uh, we have some general protection, mm, an instrument that is the American Convention of Human Rights that um, don't have any special norm about uh, disability, but uh, we have a convention, a conventional additional protocol on economical, social and cultural rights that have a specific article on, dis on disability and regulations, some regulations pertaining to the right to work and to the right to education. And, but uh, this, um, the, the approach is more meta um, medical model. No, 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 uh, so no, doesn't express mm, the social model of disability and the human rights approach. Uh, we have the Convention for the Prevention, Sanction, and Eradication of Violence Against Women. And uh, we have some uh, norms that are interesting, uh, intersectional discrimination, and uh, give visibility to vulnerability of girls and women with disability to violence. And uh, we have the Inter-American Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination and Intolerance uh, that uh, recognize disability and mental illness, different, mm? um, uh, uh, like a condition, uh, so the disability, sorry, mental illness condition as a factor of discrimination. And we have uh, the Inter-American Convention on Protecting the Human Rights of Older Persons that is new uh, and have uh, some um, approach a similar approach to legal capacity in some terms, like the United Convention of Disability. And we have a specific protection, like I told you, that is the Inter-American Convention of, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Persons with Disabilities. Um, this uh, was in 1999, mm, it's previous, the US, uh, Universal Convention. And the objectives are identified in, in, identified in Article 2 and are to seek the prevention and elimination of all forms of discrimination against persons with disability and to promote their full integration into society. Uh, but uh, this uh, convention um, was very criticized uh, because uh, don't have a, a, a approach, a human rights approach, and it's more like some uh, political advice mm, to the government. And have, uh, um, the, the approach is, is, is not uh, perhaps not so good, but uh, we have uh, some articles uh, that give some tools. For example, discrimination of, uh, on the basis of uh, disability. 
And this is, in, uh, in general, the, the main uh, norms at the normative framework. And <clears throat> um, with these norms, mm, uh, we have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights mm, with a different function, yes? Uh, one is uh, jurisdictional and, and the other is uh, co consultant advice. Mm? And uh, we have had some cases mm, at this level. <clears throat> and the main cases which the Inter-American and the Commission intervened have been about persons uh, with psychosocial disabilities. Mm? The first case was very famous, um, Victor Rosario Congo versus Ecuador. In 1999, uh, was a, a person with psychosocial disability who died mm, inside the, an institution. And it was the first case that the Inter-American Commission inter in, um, take uh, and give uh, some uh, um, some uh, uh, rules about the protection that need a person with disabilities. And the second uh, neuropsychiatric hospital of Paraguay, uh, the Inter-American Commission inter interview, inter inter intervino, uh, intervene, <laughs> intervene, and it was like a 40, uh, if, uh, a lot of people that uh, uh, was in the, in, the, in the institution and doesn't have her human rights um, respect. And then Jimenez Lopez versus Brazil, that the Inter-American Court and, um, give more reasons uh, about the necessity of uh, special protection Mm -hmm. uh, when the person are in a uh, in situation of vulnerability, but I have to, I must tell you that uh, in, the, in at these cases, um, previous uh, the convention, uh, and neither the court, neither the commission, um, uh, show that uh, that persons were uh, um, deprivation of liberty. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Furlan and, and her family versus uh, Argentina uh, in the Inter-American Court, and Atavia Murillo y otros versus Costa Rica. There, is, is, there are two cases uh, when the, the, the court uh, introduced the social model of disability and the parameters, some parameters of the um, Universal Convention hmm, of Person with Disabilities. And in Furlan, the, the, the case versus Argentina, uh, was a very uh, important case uh, in matter of access to justice hmm, and due process of person with disability. But that I, I want to, to show um, uh, today is um, and, um, uh, the interpretation that, do you remember that I told you that at the Inter-American system we have the Inter-American Convention special and we have a committee. Hmm? The committee made a, a good, uh, for me, a very good interpretation of one article of the Inter-American Convention, Article uh, 12.B, mm, that said, in cases where internal legislation provides the declaration of interdiction when it necessary or appropriate, such declaration do does not constitute discrimination. So, like you can see, contrast the Article 12 of the Universal Convention. So, this was very important because this committee made a general observa observation hmm, uh, and reinterpreted, reinterpreted uh, the meaning. Hmm, and um, the committee warned of the contradiction within this rule and the United Nations Convention standard and said uh, that this article Need, need to be reinterpreted in light of the new paradigm set forth in Article 12. Uh, 
uh, urged uh, to states to take measures consist, uh, consistent with Article 12 of the United Nations Convention and ensure the recognition of universal legal capacity, including all persons with disability, regardless of the type or degree of, of disability, and uh, recommended that the state substitute the practice of interdiction, guardianship, or any other that affects the legal capacity of persons with disability, instead favoring the practice of decision making with support system. Mm? Uh, and, and more other things, no? but this is a, a resume. And I think that it was very important because the, the, the inter-American system, this is a very good example, uh, like the inter-American system, uh, reinterpreted a norm, an internal norm of the system uh, on, in light of the Universal Convention of Disability. And taking this account, um, <clears throat> yes, in this context, uh, I would like to share with you some brief comments of the reformation of the Argentine Civil and Commercial Code. Mm. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, um, inside the region there are uh, three or four countries, or like more, that uh, are uh, making changes in legal, capa legal capacity matter. Mm. And in Argentina, we had a, 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 a difficult process uh, with this, the, the, uh, this matter. And in 2015, the civil code mm, uh, was modified. And uh, in legal capacity, uh, we, some organizations, so, social um, civil organization and some academics, uh, a lot of, of person uh, um, um, uh, intervenimos, intervenimos, uh, participamos, Participate. Participate. participate, uh, giving some advices, but uh, perhaps uh, we, we could introduce some advices and we couldn't another. Mm? And this is the result, mm? the new code, that I, I want to share some, only, only three articles with you. Mm? The first, that is general rules, mm? uh, general rules to apply the code that I think that uh, introduce the social model of disability. Mm? because uh, first it's the, the general capacity of, of humans' abilities to exercise legal capacities presumed, even when this person is held in an assisted facility institution. That's perhaps is obviously, it's obvious, but it's necessary because you know that when the person um, go to an institution or an assist fa assisted facility, uh, perhaps lost a lot of uh, human rights and the legal capacity is the first one. Uh, limitation on capacity are exceptional and may only be imposed for the benefit of the person. This is important because in the um, uh, antique code, uh, the limitation of legal capacity was thinking uh, uh, to protect the person uh, in objecting parameters, uh, parameter parameters that was external of the person. And now we introduce the benefit of the person. And how we know how is the benefit of the person thinking and seeing the person, her preference, her, her needs, or his needs. A state intervention is always interdisciplinary in nature, both in treatment and in a judicial process. This is important uh, if disability is not only um, an individual or medical condition, uh, it's a social, uh, not condition, construction, <laughs> situation. Um, it's important that the, the, the look the, uh, um, be brought. Uh, the person has the right to receive information through means suitable for their understanding, then uh, introduce a condition of accessibility, um, reasonable accommodation, and other uh, modes of communication. 
the person has the right to participate in the judicial process with legal assistance, which must be provided by the state if the person lacks the means. This is important because in the antique code in Argentina, the person um, doesn't consider as a party in the process mm? and doesn't have, uh, don't, don't have, doesn't have a, a represent, legal representation. And now this is an obligation. And um, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic alternative less restrictive of rights and freedoms of the person should be prioritized. And we have the Article 32 that is a, a little problematic, and I have only, I think, two minutes. <laughs> uh, but I, I invite you to begin in for the last paragraph. Uh, exceptionally, when the person is absolutely un unable to interact with their surrounding and cannot express his or her will through any adequate means, and the support system available is ineffective, the judge may declare legal incapacity and appoint a guardianship, a decision maker. Uh, as you can see, this is an objective situation, objective, that is not related to a condition. Mm? Uh, no, it's not related to a disability, it's not related to a gender, yes? It's an objective uh, situation when the person is absolute, absolutely uh, enabled to interact with the surrounding. Mm? In this case, uh, uh, the judge can uh, declare incapacity and uh, appoint a guardianship. But in the other cases, in the other cases, now I invite you to read the first time, the judge may rest restrict the capacity for determinated acts, for determinated acts of a person over 13 years of age who suffers from an addiction or a permanent or prolonged mental, I traduce uh, uh, alteration. Uh, the code, the civil code in Spanish say alteración mental. Mental alteration, I don't know if you understand in English. Mm, it's, it's like, I, I think that the, the code want to say mental illness, mm, but in very bad terminology, worse. Um, of sufficient gravity, provided that the judge estimate that the exercise of the person's legal capacity might result in damage to the person or their property. We have a very, uh, uh, we have a problem with this article, with the part, because uh, the good part is that uh, the chat can only restrict the capacity of the person and for determinate acts. Hmm? Um, the antique co code was like uh, white and black, and now we have a lot of va variety of colors. And, uh, but the problem is like it's related related to or addiction or a, a mental alteration. Mm? So it's not, uh, it's a contradiction with Article 12 of the Convention. But the good part is that in these cases, mm, it's not a guardianship, uh, it's a support system mm, to the person. Mm? Uh, perhaps, uh, and the, the jurisprudence uh, is uh, um, uh, interpreting, interpre uh, uh, interpreting that um, uh, intellectual disability, obviously, uh, is uh, uh, the same. Is is is, is in, the, in in inside mental alteration, mm? but the the good for take the, the support systems. And in relation, I'm finishing. In relation to such acts, the SHAS must designate the necessary supports provided for in Article 43, specifying the function with reasonable accommodation according to the needs and circumstances of the protected person. The designated supports should promote autonomy and favor the decision that correspond with the preference of the protected person. I, uh, I had the, the uh, article 43, but I don't have time. I, um, it's the, this is uh, like the concept, the function, and the designation of the support, but it's important <coughs> that the function of the support uh, is promote the autonomy of the person. Mm -hmm. And to finish now, because we, we, I don't have more time, uh, uh, I think that uh, to, uh, today, at the morning, uh, someone was talking about the importance, the, the importance of the uh, judicial process. Mm -hmm. 
and the Argentinian code introduced uh, this, the person is considered subject of law and party of the judicial process when uh, his, his or his, uh, her legal capacity is in uh, juego. Is, uh, okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, oh, oh mm, mm, mm. sorry, the first. Okay, uh, now <laughs> I'm. Uh, okay, so now in Argentina, um, like uh, say uh, Michael Stein, the process does not revolve on clarifying whether a person with disability possesses legal capacity, hmm? but rather on what the person needs in order to exercise their capacity. And in this process, the judge must secure participation of the, port, the person and how, uh, guaranteeing and securing uh, accessibility conditions, reasonable accommodation, a system support, and legal represent, representation, and interdisciplinary approach. Uh, this inside, during the process, and I think that uh, this is very important, and we have, a, um, we have to work a lot to make practice these uh, obligations. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And I, I, t I give you my email uh, if you want to uh, continue. We continue okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Augustina, for that uh, really interesting um, presentation on the dynamics in Latin America. And uh, we can open up the discussion on that in the questions and answer session in a little bit. So we turn now to our next speaker, who is our colleague here from the Center for Disability Law and Policy, Dr. Um, Maria Serra. And Maria um, was awarded her PhD, PhD recently um, from Madrid, um, King Carlos III University in Madrid in Spain. And her research really is in the field of intersectionality, um, women with disabilities, equality and non-discrimination. And Maria has been tasked with the very difficult job of looking at the tensions. And we had a large debate about whether we should call these tensions um, at the UN level and um, between different sources of human rights law. So I'll hand you over to Laura and Maria. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so like Charles says, my presentation is about the CRPD and the tensions with other UN sources of law, but I'm going to concentrate about human rights treaty bodies. So, which, oh, this. Okay, so I'm starting this presentation saying that between human rights treaty bodies we have, actually we have tensions. This could be implicit or explicit discrepancies, uh, difference of approach, and also difference in the interpretation of instruments given by the treaty bodies, that this could be general comments or general recommendations, and also concluding observations. So the structure of my presentation, like I say, I'm going just to focus on human rights treaty bodies, and I'm going to talk about of two main tensions, separation of liberty and abortion, and sure, with abortion, the half of the room are going to be against me, and we can discuss that. Uh, but the thing that I want to do and the structure of the presentation is to show to you the inconsistency between the human rights treaty bodies, also to show the criteria of the treaty bodies and try to answer to that criteria, and last of all, try to think with you, with the audience, of a solution to the tension um, of, of, of the human rights treaty bodies. So why this presentation, or which, which is the purpose? So I want to invite you to think and try to find some answers among the tensions between human rights treaty bodies. And it, the presentation seeks to identify ways of harmonizing all the discourse of the main human, uh, UN uh, human rights mechanisms. In fact, this time I'm going to just to talk about human rights treaty bodies, not uh, of all the mechanisms. I think that ha the harmonization is needed so that we can fulfill human rights values. Uh, I'm talking about digni human dignity, equality, solidarity, and liberty. 
And I think also that human rights treaty bodies have to complement each other because they served a larger purpose that is developing human rights as a whole, as a system, and not just look uh, to their convention. So the first tension that I want to talk is about the deprivation of liberty. There is a fact, there is a reality that people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities face different kinds of deprivation of liberty. This could be detention by the police, imprisonment, uh, confinement in psychiatric institutions or hospitals, in social care homes, or so on, so on. So why is this happen in domestic law, like during the morning was saying, maybe because the paradigm of the social model of disability has not passed through the criminal justice law of the countries and also the mental health laws. And in the international human rights law, maybe because there is not a unified approach regarding the absolutely ban on deprivation of liberty on the basis of impairment. So what is the legal framework regarding the liberty of the persons, of all persons, with and without disabilities? So we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and of course the CRPD. So if we took the liberty of a person with disability, we are violating uh, these two human rights treaties and also the CRPD. In all cases, if we took the liberty of a person, we are violating Article 5 regarding non-discrimination, legal capacity, access to justice, and of course, liberty and security, Article 14. And in most of the cases, there are some other articles that we are violating, Article 19, 15, 16, 17, and of course, 25, regarding health. So what happened is not just the legal framework that we are violating. If we took the liberty of a person with disability, we are also violating the values that underpin human rights uh, as a whole, as a system. I talk about equality and human dignity, and as you may know, states are obligated to fulfill these values. They are not just obligated to fulfill a legal framework because it's the law or something like that. We are talking about human rights as a whole, the, the philosophy of human rights or the theory of human rights. So we are, have to take into account these two. So what, have, what Article 14 of the CRPD says and what is the uh, CRPD committee, the, the position of the CRPD committee? So uh, the CRPD searches for mechanisms to stop discrimination and abuse of power over persons with disabilities and through Article 14 the state's parties shall ensure that persons with disabilities have to enjoy uh, liberty and security and it states, this article states that the existence of a disability shall in no case justify the deprivation of liberty. So, we have to stop for a second here and try to read and uninterpret this article. Regarding the language, the word actually is not disability, it's impairment. Whether or not a person is experiencing a disability, because as you may know, disability is a social concept, so a disability is, um, is the result. When they took their liberty from you, that is when disabilities happen, because it's the interaction of the person with an impairment, and in this case, for example, the state that is taking out your liberty. So we have to take into account that it's not disability, the word there is impairment. This was saying by the CRPD committee about in the guidelines on Article 14. And the other thing that we have to take into account, especially if we pay attention of the Vienna Convention that teach us how to have, uh, how to, have to interpret the conventions, uh, we have to read the preparatory work of Article 14. I know that it's a supplementary interpretation, but it helps here. The preparatory work of the article says that even if additional factors or even if additional criteria are used and also to justify the deprivation of liberty, this cannot be happened. It's not that, uh, okay, we are going to justify that this is very useful. We are going to justify the deprivation of liberty of a person, not just because this person has an impairment, also because we have another factor. So this is against the statement and the position of the committee. So we have to take that into account. So this position is supported by several human rights treaty bodies and also by other special mechanisms and I think very important by the working group on arbitrary detention. Well, the, incons uh, the inconsistency is uh, between the, of course, 
the CRPD committee and the special rapporteur on torture, Juan Mendez, that is from my country, and the human rights committee in one general comment. But like I said at the beginning, I'm just going to talk about the human rights treaty. So the, the thing about the special rapporteur, I just put in here, but I don't going to talk about that. But before we start uh, with the criteria and the answer to the criteria, um, the paragraph 19 of the general comment 35, that is when the inconsistency is, it says um, the existence of a disability shall in not self uh, justify the deprivation of liberty. And if we remember the other slide uh, here, uh, the preparatory work of Article 14 said even if additional criteria are used in it, we are is against of the is against of the um, committee position. So we have the first thing here. Uh, but the thing that I want to talk about and the thing that I want to stop for a minute is about this last sentence that says that we can take the liberty from someone if it's going to harm her or herself, or if it's going to harm to other persons. So, usually the criteria dangerousness to self and to others uh, is used at uh, kind of one criteria, but for practical reasons, I think it's better if, if we can divide into criterias. So, the dangerousness to self is the first criteria. Uh, this criteria has a discriminatory approach. Uh, and also is based on paternalistic justification that is based on protectionist stereotypes. Um, harmful stereotypes are divided into two kind of stereotypes. One is the protectionist stereotypes and the other one are false stereotypes. In this case, protectionist stereotypes and of course paternalistic justification. If you want, we can talk about paternalistic justifications. I'm against that, but this is kind of my personal opinion. Uh, but in this case, this justification hide the justification of the best interest of the person. And interest of whom? It seems to me that it's not the interest of the person that are uh, taking the liberty from. So, and other thing that this was this paradigm of the best interest was solved by the CRPD committee in the general comment number one when they say that the paradigm of the best interest has to be replaced by the paradigm of will and preference. So we have to look out to the will and preference of the person and not to the best interest because we don't know which is the best interest of the person. This is the first criteria. The other criteria is the dangerousness to others. Um, this, is, this criteria also has a discriminatory approach because it reinforces the myth that people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities are dangerousness or are, are danger. Uh, this justification in this time is based in false stereotypes. Like I said, harmful stereotypes are divided into protectionist stereotype and false stereotype. False stereotype is when we attribute to a person a false characteristic in this case, is that they are dangerous to others. Uh, we have many of these false characteristics, for example, that people with intellectual disabilities are asexual, for example, but in this case are that they are dangerous to others. So we're go we are talking about here kind of a future. When I read this, I always think, I don't know if you saw Minority Report, the movie, so it's kind of, we are thinking in the future, so we are thinking that because this person has a disability, a psychosocial disability, uh, it's going to be dangerous to others, so just in case, we're going to take their liberty. This is kind of the reason, it looks very simple, but this is actually the reason of the state. So, to have a better picture of this, we can do an exercise and we can kind of compare two situations by but changing the subject. So, people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities are overrepresented in prison and or in psychiatric institutions compared with the general population. But globally, as you all may know, violence against women are increasing the rates more and more, but no man, even violent men, are in prison. I'm not saying that they have to, well, but uh, the thing that I am saying is we cannot think in the future is we don't know what the 
that person, that particular person is going to do. So we cannot take the liberty because we have a characteristic that in this case is a false stereotype, it's a false characteristic of the person. So this is the reason that I, that I have to this criteria. The other, the, the other tension is abortion. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to answer how can we solve the tension but uh, afterwards. The other tension is abortion. Uh, lack of access to safe and legal abortion services has a huge impact in women's life and in, and, and, and in women's health. There is uh, large evidence that women who want to have an abortion, they're going to do it regardless of the legality of the service. This was saying by the, by the who and by, it's, it's, it's really is an empirical evidence that this happened. And also that abortion, if it's kind, there is a kind of a taboo thing, no it's not taboo, it's a myth that if we decriminalize abortion, the rates of abortion are going to increase. This is totally false. And we have examples for that. For example, Canada uh, decriminalized um, abortion, and the number of the abortion are not increasing. Actually, they are decreasing, so we, this is false. With this evidence, we have the fact that abortion is legally restricted, when women are more likely to find clandestine abortions, therefore in unsafe medical conditions, therefore there is a risk of maternal mortality. The, the, the life of the woman is in, is in risk. So access to safe and legal abortion is a human right issue. This was said by severe human rights treaty bodies, and actually severe human rights treaty bodies are encouraging states to remove legal restrictions on abortion and ensure women access to safe uh, abortion services, to safe and legal abortion services. So human rights treaty bodies are saying that banning access to safe and legal abortion in all grounds, no matter what, no matter what grounds are we talking about, is a discrimination, is a violation on the right of privacy, is a violation of women's reproductive and sexual life, and of course is a violation on the right to the health of the woman, and on the life also. This position is supported by the CEDA committee, the Human Rights Committee, the CRC, and all the committees that you can think, but not by the CRPD committee. Why is this? Well, before we start, I want to say that this is very important, that the CRPD, as you may know, has a clear and explicit language regarding sexual and reproductive rights. This is great. It's the first human rights uh, convention that has a clear and is very, very explicit regarding sexual and reproductive rights. Nevertheless, it's the first human rights treaty body that recommends to a state party to eliminate legal ground to access abortion. This is very confusing. Uh, this happened in two concluding observations to Spain and Hungary, and the CRPD committee recommends that state party has to eliminate the fetal impairment grant for abortion to the laws that explicitly allow to have access to legal and safe abortion on this ground, just on this ground. So the committee criteria uh, is that this is a discrimination on the basis of disability. Decriminalized abortion on the ground of fetal impairment is a discrimination on the basis of disability. This is saying by the COPD committee. So my answer, we can discuss this, but restrictions, first of all, like we, I said just two minutes ago, restrictions on access to legal abortion does not prevent but increase maternal mortality, why? Because they look for clandestine abortions and carry, these clandestine abortions are carried out in unsafe medical conditions. You are here in Ireland and maybe half or more of the women, women of this country can go to the UK and make an abortion and it's going to be fine. But what happens if you don't have money? And what happened what happen in countries like mine in Argentina, we, the, we don't have countries around that have illegal abortion. Or what, what happened if you are, are in Africa? What happened, you have, we don't have to think all from the Europe um, um, side. Uh, this is another thing. But, uh, the criteria of the committee that is discrimination on the basis of a disability, like you may, like you know, disability is a social concept. So, is the result of the interaction between the person with an impairment and the environment? Which environment can, can have a fetus? I, I cannot see the environment. We can discuss if it is a person or not. I don't want to discuss that. Besides that I have my personal opinion, but I don't want to discuss that. 
I want to discuss that we cannot say that the criteria could be a discrimination on the basis of disability if we put such much emphasis saying what is a disability. And we keep saying that disability, and actually it is, is a, is a social concept. So this is kind of incoherent with the, with the own convention of the human rights treaty body, with the text, with the object, and with the purpose of the convention. And this is a pity, and, and, and because the CRPD put so much emphasis regarding the autonomy of the person, regarding the self-determination, regarding the right to own their own body. Just one thing, this is not for women without disabilities. It's for women with and without disabilities. So a woman with disabilities can have an abortion too. So we, ha we have to think the committee has been so inclusive in so many things that maybe here they, I don't know if they're thinking women with disabilities. So the right to choose also the committee have put so much emphasis and of course the right to privacy. So how can we have a consensual approach on this? First of all, human rights treaty bodies are, were created to ensure an independent knowledge process and to build specialized knowledge among uh, on independent experts. Uh, there are independent experts to create specialized knowledge regarding their convention. So the treaty bodies assume uh, an interpretative role uh, that is normally played by states. So they are bound, we can say that they are bound by the same interpretation rules as the states are. So Vienna Convention rules for human rights treaty bodies, we can say that are an obligation and they are not an option. The Vienna Convention rules uh, provide guidance and uh, to make, um, you, you know, to the to all that to the states, but also in this case to the human rights treaty bodies. And human rights treaty bodies interpretations. This is very important. We know that they establish practices, subsequent practices. So it's necessary for them to be coherent in this in this case. So how can we have a consensual approach regarding abortion? So despite that, all my answer that I gave a minute before, um, we can apply maybe a technical solution, but it's going to be not uh, among the, human the different human rights treaty bodies, but among the um, CRPD committee and the CRPD convention. So we can apply Vienna Convention, uh, Article 31 and 32 this morning, uh, they, they talk about the uh, Vienna Convention, and like I said, um, this, the, this, the committee position has to be coherent with the text, with the object, with the context, and with the purpose of the Convention. So the technical solution is there that they are not respecting the Vienna Convention in this case of abortion. With, with the own convention, with the own CRPD. Regarding deprivation of liberty is kind of more difficult. Uh, here we have, thank you. Uh, here we have uh, different human rights treaty bodies like the other one, but uh, maybe it's a question, maybe can we apply a technical solution regarding Vienna Convention? As you may know, Vienna Convention has Article 30 that talks about lex specialis, and lex specialis, like this morning they say, is uh, for in relation to the principle of lex posterior and lex, uh, you know, the, the successive um, treaties. You know, we, we, we're going to apply the, the later treaty, not, not the former treaty. But also this provision established that a normative priority regarding special rules because special rules have a great clarity than general rules. So maybe Lex Specialis appears as a conflict solution technique uh, because suggests that instead to apply the general rule, we can apply the special rule. But what happened here? Which one is special and which one is general? We have uh, two human rights treaty bodies, the Human Rights Committee and the CRPD Committee, and we have two legal provisions. They are both valid and applicable. There is no hierarchy between them, but they provide incompatible incompet direction on how to deal with the same issue, in this case, deprivation of liberty. 
Sometimes like speciality is not about general and special, it's about the means and end, because in this case, I'm sure that they don't want to have kind of, uh, they have the, the, the same point of view, but they use other means, or maybe. Yeah, because the Human Rights Committee has, has in, in this case, has the same point of view as the CRPD Committee, but they have different means. So maybe it's not about the exception, the general, the means and ends. Maybe we have to look at uh, the, the environment, the object, and the purpose that the issue that we are talking about, in this case, the deprivation of liberty of the person with disability. So with the evidence that we have that there are other um, non-coercive uh, treatments if, we, is, if a person is uh, experiencing uh, extreme distress or self-harm or whatever, there are significant empirical evidence in this, uh, uh, actually supported by organizations of people with disabilities. So we can look, like I said before, the environment and the purpose uh, that they, the, of the issue that we are talking about. And we, it's necessary to think in equality. You remember at the beginning when I say that it's not just of the legal framework, we are also have to think and take into account the values. We, we have to remember when, in all of these issues we are talking about human rights, so we have to think about the values that underpin human rights, and one of the values is equality. And equality is, is not just formal equality, we are talking about substantive equality. So we, if you can take into account that, we are going to think in real access to justice for people with the disability and respect the legal capacity of people with disability. And we don't have to break the standards of the, CR uh, of the CRPD committee. And also the rest of the human rights treaty bodies should engage with model of best practices and call the state to respect legal capacity of all persons with disability. What happened? towards a solution, and you can help me here, of all tensions. So we have to have a coherence approach. I think it's imperative in this case, and the discrepancies should be solved uh, because all of the reasons that I said before. And we need maybe more coordination between the treaty bodies. Uh, maybe concrete steps should be taken to streamline the format of concluding observation, general comments, and general recommendations in this case contact between the human rights mechanisms where specific issues of concern would be drawn to the attention of the treaty bodies which are dealing with related issues. Also, the human rights treaty bodies should be alert if, you know, if some issue is, go is going to be a debate in another human rights treaty body, they have to be there. Also, in the, maybe it's helpful or maybe not, I don't know, in the list of issues with some specific issues, treaty bodies could be involved in it when are related to the same topic, for example, in this case, deprivation of liberty. And, well, this is not my area, but maybe internal, I don't know, maybe internal meetings with the human rights treaty bodies to achieve a certain uniformity in the interpretation given to related provision by different treaty bodies would be helpful. So um, uh, we can summarize this with more connection between them. I know that the Special Rapporteur on, on Persons with Disabilities are try, uh, is trying to do, to do this. So, well, if you have any questions and if you have any criticize, you can, you can tell me. Thank you. Great, Laura. Thank you very much for that. So we have a couple of minutes for questions and answers before we go for our final tea and coffee break, and then we break out into 